Ladies and gentlemen, let's read Game Intercom video. We're going to be conducting a post mortem of the PlayStation 3. We know that Sony did just that when they were first trying to design the PlayStation 4. They went basically and figured out what went wrong with the PlayStation 3. And most of the issues, I think, were fairly unanimous in the minds of developers. Um, poor software support to begin with. Uh, the cell processor was also a little bit tricky, as well as the memory. But what in this video we're going to be doing is diving really in depth into the console. We're going to figure out what Sony has learned with it. We're going to figure out what the gaming industry has learned with it. We're also going to be taking a look at how it works, um, including things such in this video as a very in-depth look at the cell processor. And so, without further ado, let's begin. Oh, and before I forget, I am writing a series of articles on this stuff which will be showing some facts and figures that I simply can't add in to this video simply for time purposes, so I would recommend that you check out the article if you want, you know, to actually be able to have links and all the other good stuff that you'd expect. So anyway, let's get a very basic understanding of the PlayStation 3 before we jump too much into the specifics. It had, of course, the cell processor, and that was combined with 256 megabytes of RAM, which was dedicated purely for graphics. There was a further 256 megabytes of RAM, and this was allocated to the system. And finally, unlike uh, AMD, our best buddies with Sony uh, for the PlayStation 4, Sony previously went with NVIDIA, and they were utilizing the RSX Reality Synthesizer. It also, of course, included a hard drive as standard and a Blu-ray drive. So now we've got that basically out of the way, let's go into the specifics and let's discuss the style processor. Now, regular viewers will probably be fairly familiar with both RISC and CISC. RISC, R-I-S-C, means Reduced Instruction Set Computing. We, meanwhile, the reverse is true with CISC, C I. SC, and that stands for Complex Instruction Set Computing. So, before we go too much into the actual inner workings and design of the cell processor, it's very important that we understand what the differences are between reduced and complex instruction sets. So, all that instruction set is, and we're going to simplify it a little bit for this, because I've discussed it somewhat in previous videos, but you can Google it if you so desire or read the article. Um, reduced instructions that basically have less instructions built straight on to the CPU. Now those instructions can be used for a plethora of different things. They can be used, for example, for memory management, such as moving data from one uh, part of the CPU to, say, a place in the memory. Or they can be used, for example, for video processing. Uh, in some cases, the instructions lended themselves to that. They can be, for example, floating point operations. They can be for arithmetic uh, and much more besides. Automatically, those of you who are thinking, well, that sounds a lot better than reduced. I mean, you know, if it's got all of those instructions on there, why on earth would you create reduced instruction set, which is actually what the cell processor used? It's actually fairly simple reasoning. Um, you don't get space on a die for free. Now, the cell processor was using a 90NM manufacturing process, and it turns out that a lot of the space they utilized um, for the CISC was put into the SPEs, we'll go into that, as well as registers and other bits and pieces. Um, there was a lot of cash on the cell processor, and because it's reduced instruction set, they were able to fit a lot more of the stuff that speeds up the processor in terms of basic raw hardware, but at the cost of that were instructions. So I know what you're going to say. Well, what's this trade-off? What does that mean? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, Imagine that you are a games developer and you're writing lines of code. Um, when you're developing, when you're using algorithms, well, algorithms, so when you're using languages such as C++ or versions of C, there are a couple of versions of C now. There's like C, C++, C, C++11, uh, there's Python, and many others. Most games, however, not all, but most are written in C or C derivatives. And 
when you're doing this, you can basically access libraries and specific functions very easily. So I've used this example tons of times, but um, there's mathematical examples. There's, um, for example, uh, IO stream, which is input and output, which allows you to output data um, straight to the screen. In other words, you're printing it. For example, you could print a simple string like hello world or whatever. And all of this um, utilizes libraries and instructions that are right there. Now, I am simplifying this for the purposes of just explaining it, but all this basically means is that if you're a programmer and you're trying to do a memory operation, the more complicated stuff like memory operations and so on, that aren't necessarily, or mathematical uh, equations that aren't necessarily part of a reduced instruction set um, architecture, you have to actually code those yourself. You can't simply call the instruction. This can lead to some issues, including much greater programming time. It means that you need to become familiar with the RISC uh, architecture as well. So there you have that. So the cell was actually using the power or power PC architecture. It actually could accept binaries technically from either one. At its heart was known as the PPE. The PPE was also known as the power processing processor element and that ran at a pretty nice 3.2 gigahertz it also handled two hardware threads simultaneously as some may be aware that ppe was actually the basis of the processor inside the xbox uh, 360 the xbox 360 cpu meanwhile was actually free of these ppes together um, it was a somewhat different design and it basically allowed the processor to be able to handle six hardware threads rather than um, two. However, the cell was very different. Um, it would farm out, and we'll talk about these a lot more in a moment, a lot of the work to the SPEs, also known to their buddies as synergistic processor elements, or processing, I'm always getting those two confused. Um, and they could handle a lot of the work. They were actually a SIMD, which is Single Instruction Multi-Data. We will go into that in just a moment, I promise. So the actual cell processor was made by three companies. It was kind of like a combined work. It was the meeting of minds between Sony, Toshiba, and IBM. And Ken Kataragi, who of course was known as the father of the PlayStation, was actually thinking of the cell as in a biological system where cells come together to form a being, you know, a human, an animal, a plant, whatever. And the idea behind this was that loads of cell processors, uh, the SPEs and whatever else, they could all be linked together and they could process a data incredibly quickly. Now, as it turns out, Sony paid literally hundreds of millions to set up uh, manufacturing processes and much more besides. And the chips were complicated to produce and we will go into it in a moment. But one of the primary issues that Sony learned from this, and this is of course um, obvious with the PlayStation 4, is that the chips were very prohibitively expensive. One of the reasons that the PlayStation 3 actually shipped to be more expensive than the Xbox 360, obviously there were a few features such as the Blu-ray drive was more expensive than the more tried and tested DVD drive of the Xbox 360, but also, as it turns out, the cell processor. Now, some people at the time were blaming things such as the Wi-Fi connections and the deep Blu-ray drive, and I remember uh, these arguments on forums that I frequented consistently, but in actuality, most of the blame needed to be leveled towards the cell. The cell processor not only was expensive to manufacture, but it was also expensive to for R&D research and development. And you can imagine just how much money these companies poured into it. And so, consequently, they couldn't just slash the price of the console. They wanted to. Um, they wanted to release it fairly cheaply, but they just couldn't. It was that simple. And it actually took them 
time to reduce the manufacturing processes. In other words, to take it from 90 nm to 65 and so on. And when they do that, of course, they're using the silicon um, and eventually they can get better yields, which of course is extremely important. Now, it might sound very strange, but according to IBM, the cell processor is actually 10 times faster than existing CPUs were on a lot of applications. Now, I know what you're gonna say, well, that, that sounds rubbish. I mean, that, that sounds like marketing spiel, but actually not. Um, we'll go into exactly why in just a moment, but if you think about it, GPUs, which are graphic processing units, also known as graphics cards, also known as Radeons and uh, G-forces and whatever else, we all know, uh, if you, especially if you're a regular watcher, that they can do things such as compute technology. Now, Sony learned early on that there were going to be things such as physics and so on involved. Now, Mark Cerny, who of course is our best buddy for designing the PlayStation 4, um, as well as Microsoft, they are starting to farm off compute work to the GPU. They are offloading this to the GCN architecture, the ACE or asynchronous compute engines. If you want to know more about that, you can check out the compute video, um, which is under the Xbox uh, One versus PlayStation 4 uh, on the front page of the channel. But um, effectively, back then, a lot of this work was actually being farmed off to the SPEs. Uh, we'll go into those in a moment. So. Before we discuss the SPEs, which are really cool and awesome, let's discuss the power processor element. Now, this in many ways is a very simple to understand processor. It's based on the power architecture and is two-way multi-threaded. So it can handle two hardware threads. And most importantly, acts as the controller. In other words, it tells what to do to the SPEs. Now, depending on what um, what it's doing, it can actually handle about 25.6 G-flops if it's running at 3.2 gigahertz. This is in addition to the SPEs, and we'll go into those in just a moment. Um, the PPE has 64 kilobytes of level one cache, which uh, is actually split between instruction and data, 32 uh, each. And in addition to that, you're looking at 512 of level two. Now, the main goodie of the cell, and the reason it's the cell and not the uh, Xbox 360 CPU, also known as the Xenon, is the SPEs. Now, the synergistic processing elements are SIMD. Now, this basically means single instruction multi-data, and they're 128-bit vector processors. This means that they're designed to process lots of data simultaneously. One instruction is sent out and all the processes start working and will process the data and move on. Now, there are actually eight processors, eight of these processors on um, the PlayStation 3's chip, but one of them is actually for redundancy. So seven are working, one is disabled. They're manufactured like this purposefully um, so that let's assume one of them is balked when the system's uh, being produced, then you've got one spare. It's basically to increase yields. Now single precision, these suckers actually give exactly the same amount of power as the PPE each. So you're looking at 25.6 G-flops of computing power, which is single precision, may I add, and that's if they're running at the uh, 3.2 gigahertz. So you're looking at just over 200 um, G-flops if you're combining them all together, which is quite a lot of performance. Now, the PPEs are actually in order processors. Now in order processors basically mean that they have to wait for an instruction to come along in a specific manner. This is contrary to the processors that we're getting today such as the AMD Jaguar. The AMD Jaguar is an OOO which stands for out of order and that means that data can be executed much faster. 
that means that at times you can actually have a single hardware thread stalled because it's waiting, it's searching for a particular piece of data to come along. When it finds it, it will then execute it. There's another slight deficiency in the cell. It actually lacks what is known as a branch predictor. Now, this basically helps the CPU guess which way to go when it's following an algorithm. Now, this basically means that when you have programming, when you're learning programming, uh, there are what is known as if-then-else statements. So, for example, and this is a very simple one, let's assume for the purposes of this that you are um, trying to do a mathematical, let's make it really simple. Let's say you have a simple equation and let's say if 1 plus 1 equals 2 or greater than 2 then equals then you know print on screen hi if 1 plus 1 equals less than 2 then you know print sad face or something like that okay so in other words that's a very simple and very obvious branch prediction but there are times when it becomes far more complicated and it has to start figuring out things such as physics. Um, these can be used for mathematical equations, these can be used for uh, predicting choices, they can be used for a lot of this is used for AI and much more besides. So obviously some of this is based upon user input and some of it is used based on getting variables back, in other words a piece of data that was previously entered into the CPU. All this basically means is, I'm sure you might be aware, it depends if you're into programming or not, but um, a variable is stored on a piece of memory and let's assume that that variable is 1 and another variable, another location is 2, then you can do anything with those two variables. You can combine them together to form, say, 3 or you could um, minus 1 by the other one, so you could say 1 minus 2, which would give you negative 1, or you could do the opposite and you could say uh, 2 minus 1. You could do whatever because those variables are entered. But the purposes of branch prediction on if-then structures, and I will be going into the stuff. I'm actually learning a lot about programming myself. I'm still not the greatest programmer. I'd have a lot to learn, but I am starting to learn it, so I will be covering the stuff. Um, but effectively, most of this is actually instructions. Remember, we were talking about this. A lot of these instructions are actually built onto the processor. And of course, because it was RISC, it didn't have that room to do it. Now, just like their big brothers, the SPEs are also uh, in order. There's no out of order whatsoever. Now, this also means that the compiler is incredibly important. There's no way on earth that the compiler can put every single instruction in the exact order that a game needs to execute it. Why? Because games are not linear. right? To have artificial intelligence that reacts to what you're doing rather than just acts as a drone and just, you know, is the classic space invaders waddle 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 or you know of uh, say pac-man or um just puts the head up every three seconds and takes a pot shot and then puts it back down there has to be elements of unpredictability right it's the same as it can't predict what you're going to do it can't execute data i'm going to give you a really really simple or not very realistic point of view but let's say you're playing a game and let's say there's a stack of books the game can't predict if you're going to press that button to knock over the stack of books and even if it knows because it's based, you know, it's been doing analysis based on your nature of a gamer, and it, it's like, wow, this gamer really hates stacks of books. He really wants to push every single one of the bloody things over. You can't tell if you're going to save the opportunity to push over the stack of books for three seconds, or if you're just going to do it instantly, or whether you're going to come back, search the chest, then push over the books. You don't know. In other words, it's very hard for a... Um, a compiler to do that. Now obviously I'm simplifying some of this stuff 
because I want people to understand it. I will cover it in much greater depth in another video, but I don't want to go too much into this stuff in this video without a uh, video to actually back it up. So I'll be actually showing you guys demos of this in the future, uh, next couple of weeks or so when I just uh, have a little bit more time. But anyway, I'm really hoping you understand the basics of it, or at least the gist. Um, if you've got more questions, you can just ask me on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash redgamingtech. So anyway, moving on. Fortunately, the SPEs do have 128 registers. So in theory, what can happen is that it can actually put the, the loops on these. It can let the compiler unroll the loops, plop them on there, and it does help to reduce the need for OOO because all of the stuff is already there so it can just process it as it needs it. It doesn't make it particularly an elegant solution. Now Sony have noticed this. Sony, when they were working on the PlayStation 4, and one of the reasons that they went with x86 um, is because of this. They said to themselves, you know what, uh, we need a great instruction set that makes it easy for developers. None of this is easy for developers. It means that they need their uh, performance on point. Now, the SPEs actually can work in a very awesome way, however. The SPEs can actually be used as a stream processors. Now, I'm sure if you're familiar with high-end GPUs, um, or basically any recent GPU, you'll be fairly familiar with that, what that means. Basically, one or more of these SPEs can be asked to, to do multiple things. What will basically happen? CPU, the uh, PPA, will tell the SPEs to read a piece of data. So they'll read the, they'll read the data, and then they'll do that from a local store, their own local store. They'll calculate the result so let's, let's just make this really simple let's say they are asked to take two uh, let's say that they are asked to eight minus three right that's that's their really complicated mathematical equation so they do this from two variables they might have to get two variables so let's call variable uh, let's call the first variable x and let's put mentally you just say x equals 5 and let's say that y equals uh, 8 so all they do they store x and y into their local store and they'll say okay y minus x equals and then they print the result back to the local store this is very simplistic but hopefully it just gives you an idea how this all works and so they can do this in a streaming processor environment. So lots and lots of these processors can all work together. Now, the great part of this is, let's say the SPE is like, okay, I'm choking here, guys. I can't do this myself. I'm, you know, I'm struggling. Help me. Then another SPE can actually jump in and be like, I've got your back, bro. I'll help you out. It's actually really cool because of that. Now, that means in case you've not understood this so far, and I'm pretty sure you probably would have because, you know, um, I've hopefully broken it down so you understand the very basics of how this works. Um, the cell process was incredibly powerful for the time of its release. It really, really was. I mean, in terms of raw GFLOPs, it could actually handle more than even a lot of modern day GPU, uh, CPUs. It really was a kick-ass CPU. There were problems of it though. Um, it was very complicated to utilize. Um, it required a lot of understanding. The SPEs um, were amazing. You could get so much performance out of them that they could actually be utilized uh, to do a lot of graphics processing because of their nature. They could actually do things such as anti-aliasing. They could do physics. They could do memory defragmentation. They could do artificial intelligence. Does any of that stuff sound familiar? It should, because that's exactly what the GCN cores, um, or the ACE engines of the GCN cores can do. Sony realized this, they realized it was incredibly important, and now they've offloaded it for the CPU and they're farming it out to the GPU. So in other words, it's, how can I put this? It's an extension of it. They haven't 
scrapped it. They've just said, you know what, we are going to make it easier. Now, as it turns out, um, the libraries available for utilizing GCN architecture and so on are actually very similar to the SPEs. A lot of it is, you know, that th they're um, they're creating a, their own libraries, you know, based on it. I uh, still need to go actually into the rest of the programming stuff for the PlayStation 4. Hopefully I can do that tomorrow. Um, so much stuff I need to do. I can only apologize. It's really difficult, difficult, I'm sorry, to keep up with everything, but there you have it. Um, and so Sony have learned a lot of these lessons and they are moving forward. They're trying their damn best to uh, carry on the extension. The problem is that processor, the cell processor was very powerful. It just lacked a lot of the instructions built in. It didn't have a let's say great user manual. That's a good way to put it. Um, Sony's support initially sucked. They worked on getting a really powerful uh, how should I put it? They worked on basically the hardware. They got the hardware working to the point where it was really powerful and then they kind of went oh well there you go then guys have fun and then developers were like um but I don't understand what you did with this and then they had to write the instruction manual later and obviously I may be over uh, simplifying it but that's pretty much what they did they 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 created this really powerful processor that was really awesome but they just did, didn't think to themselves how in the love of goodness are people going to be able to utilize this easily. And it just meant that the tool sets available, the instructions available made it much more complicated. It meant that developers needed to add a lot more code in to get the most out of the system. They needed to... to understand the SPEs. There were actually some games that just were like, you know what, forget it. I'm not even going to touch the SPEs. They're fine. I'm just going to work on the PPEs. So imagine you've got, uh, well, pretty much, you know, the bulk of the, you know, the reason to even own the cell processor. We actually put the cell processor in the damn machine. I'm sorry, guys. That's my phone. I forgot to put it on silent. I'm so sorry. Um, um, you have this bloody you know system the the best part of it is you know the SPEs and developers at the start just didn't even know how to use them they just you know it was it was a mess um, that combined with the in-order execution which meant that you had to put a hell of a lot of work into the compiler uh, there were lacking bu uh, bug testing tools as well so you couldn't really t see how the performance was working now, the great thing is that if the SPEs are working on something that is a logical progression, they were incredibly power powerful. It meant that developers really needed to understand parallelization. Uh, in other words, putting the data over multiple different car, um, multiple different SPEs, they needed to learn that very well. It was pretty awesome, though, because... To be honest with you, there were a hell of a lot of different potential that you could do. Um, there were a lot of different instruction sets. You could use single or dual precision floating points. You integer operations on it. Um, you can scale uh, scalar operations. You can do... There were even apparently some, or if not pretty much most of, the uh, PlayStation 2's Emotion Engine stuff in there. Um, logical operations, logical operations, um, much more besides, there was also much more besides that I'm not going to go into, but because we're going to be starting to talk about how to program and stuff for it, which isn't really uh, in the scope of this video. But my point being, it was very powerful. Developers such as Naughty Dog um, got the most out of the system. That wasn't to say it was perfect. Uh, it had a hell of a lot of potential. I actually think, uh, closing thoughts, that the PlayStation 4 could have been a monster if it had actually used an improved cell. 
uh, it would have to have been a massively improved cell, much less power. It would have had to have used a unified memory engine as well, and it could have maybe worked really well with something like the GCN architecture or a NVIDIA equivalent, but imagine all of that level of parallelization. It would have been too difficult for most programmers to deal with, especially because Sony wanted to start tapping into the smaller games developers as well, who, let's just be honest, they don't have the resources to do it. That's not anything against them. That's not to say they're stupid. That's not to say they're bad at programming. That's not to say that they don't have incredible games. It's just to say that they are not Naughty Dog. You know, I don't know if you saw the Twitter picture from Naughty Dog. Uh, if not, Google Naughty Dog, uh, what was it? Naughty Dog PlayStation 4 development shipments or something like that. And look how many PlayStation 4 units they were shipped to work on their title, whatever the hell they're working on, yeah? My point being, there's no way that an indie company can work like that. So they've got very limited resources. You know, you get in one, two, three, four people working on a title like, say, uh, Rezo Gun, I think, has like four people. I think it's two full timers and two part timers. So let's say three, four people. It's, you know, it is very complicated stuff. So, what's left? Well, we're going to be discussing the memory systems of the, the PlayStation 4, uh, PlayStation 3, if I can get the word out. We're going to be discussing things such as the Blu-ray, we're going to be discussing the DVD, uh, the hard drive in it, we're going to be discussing um, overall uh, internet access, the DualShock controller, and much more besides. So, hopefully you've learned something in this video, because that is my aim of the game. I I do a lot of research for you guys, and I'm not just saying that, I really do. Some of my videos take, you know, two to three hours to research, sometimes more, sometimes a couple of days. But I do it to teach you guys something, and myself as well. It's always nice to learn something you haven't, so it's always really good to, you know, know that I've at least enriched a little bit of knowledge into someone. Anyway, um, enough of such frivolity, I still need to continue my Xbox One breakdown, so... Uh, I'm just going to go whip myself for a moment, and then I'm going to continue work. So hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Uh, hopefully I'll see you for part two of this. I'll take care of yourselves. Have a great day, and bye for now.